Jamaica is just a small island, but the, the effect that its music's had on the whole of the world is immense. Twenty million records come out of Jamaica every year, which is ridiculous. It's for, that's a phenomenon, you know, for the amount of people that are here. The place I long to be. That's all we played was reggae music, and so it became a, a, a seriously big part of my life. Just to see the girls it's the sexiest music in the world. When it's playing very loud and you can feel it, and you're holding on to a lady, it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling, you know. I mean, no other music um, moves me like reggae does. UB40 are arguably the most successful reggae group in the world. Bob Smeaton's film tells the story of the group's formative days in Birmingham over 20 years ago and how their subsequent success has given them the opportunity to meet and record with some of the artists whose music has been the inspiration behind their desire to play reggae music. The choice of playing reggae music was the easiest thing in the world for us because that's what we all loved as a, you know, as a unit. Not to play it, but I mean just, you know, uh, just the choice of, you know, of what sort of style of music. This is Trafalgar Road, and this is where we really got down to uh, um, learning to play our instruments. But there's a house we're coming up to now on the right-hand side. It's actually this one here, this beige one. And there was a cellar downstairs which we converted, and we started and, you know, to learn to play. Oh, this pub here now, uh, on the corner of York Road and uh, King's Eve High Street, it's called the uh, Hair and Hounds. It was actually the fir very fir first show that we played and it was for a friend's birthday party. I think we did about a 14 minute set there, you know, and that was really nerve wracking. Remember your first introduction to uh, reggae music? I didn't actually discover an existing form of music. I was listening to ska, uh, which was Jamaican pop music. It was like American R&B, but twisted, you know, turned around. And it, in fact, it was the same material because almost everything that came out of Jamaica was a cover of an American song, you know, an American R&B tune. So it was, it was familiar in that sense because it had the R&B feel to it, but it was, it was the offbeat and the bass line, you know. Did the fact that it, that, it, that it had these Jamaican roots, did you find, was that an exotic attraction? Did you find this was added to its attraction? Absolutely, yes, yeah. of course. It was, it was like nothing I'd heard before. And it was exotic because it was from a faraway country, you know, and all these black people around me were playing it, you know. Yep. Um, I don't really know. I just thought it was the greatest thing I'd ever heard. <laughs> Immigrants who flocked to Britain in the late 50s, early 60s, took their music with them. And, and that is one of the interesting aspects of how that music seeped into the, the mainstream of British pop music. All of a sudden there was a load of Jamaican kids in our neighborhood and then before you knew it, there was house parties every single weekend that started on Friday night, finished Monday morning. And you just couldn't go anywhere in Birmingham without hearing it. Was that your experience as well? Was it just the fact that it was all around and... Insistent? I think so. It was, it was new. It was 
the music of the youth. See, when I got into it, I mean, I was aware of Scar and everything, and I've, I mean, I own Scar Records, um, but I fell in love with Rocksteady, really, which was when it slowed down. After Rocksteady comes reggae at, in roughly 1968, and that has really remained the kind of generic term for, for popular Jamaican music. People didn't know the right name to call it, you know. People, some people call it Blue Beats and other names, too, you know. So when I say, let's do the reggae, I, I didn't know that I was, I was going to be the inventor for the word, really as I saw it in the Guinness Book of World Record, you know. So um, that's what it is. It was just simple coming to the vibe, you know. It's a suffering vibe. It's a vibe of truth and right, you know. Ready that so I'm not a musicologist to any kind, and I haven't studied it, but I still get a feeling that reggae's contributed certain unique styles to, to music. And the first style, I think, was the, the One Drop, which came out of Scar. It started off as 4-4 four, four and variations like any other form of pop music. Then they developed this One Drop, which uh, I think has stayed with reggae, and it's probably the most recognisable style of uh, reggae drumming, which went kind of like this in the old Scar days. Uh, it might not seem much for when you bring the back in it. Had you all been at school together? Had you known each other for quite a while? We went to school together, you know, where most of us from the age of 11 sort of thing. But uh, we found ourselves unemployed, and we were unemployed for three years, you know, after being thrown out of school around about 15, 16. First year, of course, we wanted to get a job and couldn't in those, in those times. We were the one in 10, you know. I was and, the uh, one. I was an apprentice electrician. Yeah, and we were the other nine, right? I got, got a deposit for a saxophone. Yeah, mm -hmm. so then after a while, we didn't want a job, you know. Uh, you know, after, after being unemployed for two years, you know, when you're a kid like that, you know, and, all your aspirations. I can remember being, you know, at the bus stop, you know, at eight o'clock, having to go in and sign on every day because I was always late, thinking I'll never have a car, I'll never have a house, I'll never have anything, you know, and it's like, you know, it built up a resentment sort of thing. Cause no one's really tired 